Today we're going to talk about impartiality. Say impartiality. Okay, so the, the verse for today is Proverbs 18, 17. So if you could turn to Proverbs 18, 17. Proverbs 18, 17. Let me know when everybody's got it. You got it? Good, good. Proverbs 18, 17 says, The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. So that's it. That's our verse for today. But there's a lot to say about this. Let me read it one more time. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. I'm going to actually put the verse up here. Can you guys read it from there? Yeah? Let's read it together, yeah? Ready? Go. The one who states his case seems right. Okay. It wasn't completely in unison, but it'll pass. It'll pass. All right. So the other day, Joshua Alvarez sent me a YouTube video. It was a debate between James White and uh, a, a young man that goes by the name Voice of Reason. In a, and he's, this young man is a, is a Catholic apologist. And uh, he, in the debate, they're debating uh, sola scriptura, which is, which is what Protestants believe, but Catholics don't believe. You know, we believe that the scripture is the final authority for all matters of life and practice in the church and individually. But Catholics don't believe that, right? I had never seen this, this young man, you know, and he was actually really good. And he was the first to present. So he gave his case, the Catholic argument for why the Bible is an important authority for the Catholics, right? Not, this is not for us. But it's not the only authority because they believe in the authority of the Pope and the authority of the church and the authority of uh, etc. Et and I'm like, I've never, I've never heard it. Play, I never had never heard it. I'm, I'm, I'm a little familiar with those arguments. I had never heard it presented that way. And this young man, like, did a really good job, you know? And he had a really deep voice, a Latino guy. And he was debating James White, you know? And James White has been around a long time. And I'm like, man, like, this is, like, really good. And, um, and you know, even though I'm, a, I, I'm not a Catholic, I'm not going to be convinced. But at the same time, I was like, that is, that is a real good presentation, you know? Because why? Because the one who states his case first seems right a lot of times. Whenever there's something that's being debated or there's a disagreement or there's a court case... There, a lot of times the first person, especially the first person, knows what they're doing. When you first hear it, they're like, that makes sense. That makes sense. But then, of course, James White came on, and James White dismantled this young man's arguments. You know, and it's a good video. You should watch it. It's about Sola Scriptura, James White versus Voice of Reason. But this proverb illustrates something that's very important for us to have as God's people, and that is impartiality. Impartiality, I don't know if, you've, if you're familiar with the word, but impartiality is uh, something that's absolutely necessary for there to be justice, for wisdom, right? And, and it's, there's all kinds of admonitions in the Proverbs about having the ability to listen first and then also listening to the other side carefully to be able to arrive at the truth. There's other places in Proverbs 18, for example, like 18.2 says, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. All right? Do you know someone like that? Or maybe you're, you're one of those people, right? And sometimes we've all been that person at some point. Like, I'd rather, I want to, what's more important in this conversation is what I have to say. I know you want to say your things, but what I have to say is more important. Or how about 18.13, which says, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. Right? So a lot of times you speak too soon, right? You, thought, you think you know what the person's going to ask, and it turns out it was a whole other question altogether. So there's Proverbs like that all throughout, and then the one we're looking at today, which, which instructs us to wait to hear the other side before making a judgment. I mentioned back some months back when we did uh, Psalm 110 that Christ who sits at the right hand of God, right? He rules and reigns from the right hand of God. But that believers 
like it says in Ephesians 2, 6, have been raised up with him and are seated in the heavenly places with Christ. So we rule with Christ. And you could think of our time on earth as training for ruling in the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 6, 2-3 says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent, incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? And there's other verses um, in Revelation. There's three verses that talk about how God will give us authority to rule over the nations. And, and, in, uh, and in the parable of the minas, Jesus tells the, the, the good servant who invested their minas, he tells them, you will rule over ten cities. Or you will rule over five cities. Our destiny is to rule. But... We are being trained now. But what, do you, what kind of qualities do you need to be able to rule? To be able to govern? How are you going to be able to judge angels in the kingdom? And judge the nations? One of the most important qualities of rulers is the ability to wisely make judgments. Make decisions. To be able to discern what's true, what's false. But in today's time, people often make judgments based on incomplete information or on the passions of the moment or the pressure of the mob. So we need to be people of imp that have impartiality. It's crucial to have this virtue if we're going to be people of truth and if we are to be people that care about justice. Like the, 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 the verse we're looking at, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. The setting is a courtroom, where in the courtroom, the, 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 usually the prosecution goes first and states their case, they make their argument, and often, they're very persuasive, and, then, and if they're competent, then you're going to be like, that's, that's a, oh wow, that's interesting, like you, you're swayed, the judge is swayed, the jury is swayed, everyone's swayed, but, but it's important to listen to the other side, this uh, proverb is saying. But even though the proverb, the setting is a courtroom, this ability to be able to judge between right and wrong, to know who's right, who's wrong, who's in the reason, to be able to, dis to, to uh, mediate between people that are at odds with each other is a crucial, crucial um, quality. And in order to be able to do it, we need to develop this quality of impartiality. So what is impartiality? Partiality, here's some definitions. It's the equal treatment of all rivals or disputants. It's also to be called fairness. It's not treating, uh, it's treating everyone equally, not being partial or biased, all right? Um, being able to analyze things and use objective criteria to measure it. That makes sense? Makes sense so far? So far, no, not really? Yeah, I'm catching up. What, would, what, what do you think the opposite of impartiality is? Partiality, yes, right. The opposite of impartiality is partiality. The Bible, you may not have never have interacted with this word before, but it's actually all over the scripture. Partiality, in fact, according to the scripture, is a sin. So if it's a sin, it's probably good to be find out what partiality is, right? Partiality is a sin. Uh, like in Acts 10, 34, 35, and we'll touch on that verse later on, when Peter sees the Holy Spirit fall on the Gentiles, and that changes everything for him, right? Because he thought that this promise was only for the Jews. But now the Spirit is on the Gentiles. And then Peter says, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. God shows no partiality. In the old King James Version, it says, God is no respecter of persons. I kind of like the old one. He is no respecter of persons. But one clear verse that shows that partiality is a sin, right? We don't want partiality. What do we want? Impartiality. James 2, 1 through 9 says, My brothers, show no partiality. As you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's James 2 if anyone wants to read along. Show no partiality as you hold the faith. The Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly. And a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. 
And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. Verse 9, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. We see an example of man's partiality and God's impartiality also when it comes, when, when it comes to the selection of David as the king in Israel. When David goes to the sons of Jesse and he's gonna, and God tells him one of these sons is going to be the next king, um, he, he sees Eliab, and Eliab is one of the older brothers. And he thought, and Samuel thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Is before him. So he thought, because he, he was tall, he was probably, a, you know, he was a soldier, like this is surely the man God has in mind. But God said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Contrast God's uh, concern with impartiality and treating everyone fairly and equally with our obsession today of dividing people along outward characteristics like class and race and so forth. Gender as well. So Monique Dusan, who I, I was hoping to be able to invite her to the VBS for a couple of weeks ago, but I wasn't able to, to book her. But she, when she talks about uh, racism and things like that, she, she basically says that racism is, is the sin of partiality because you're making distinctions between people. But God, like I said in the King James Version, right, is not a respecter of person. I think in Spanish it's... Dios no hace acepción de personas, right? That's how it says in Spanish. God does not, he's not swayed by who, by, oh, this person is rich, or this person is tall, or this person's a man, and this person's a woman. He, and we're supposed to also be impartial when treating people, but also when treating the things we hear. We're supposed to be able to weigh the truth, and be able, weigh truth and falseness, and be able to arrive at what is correct. So far, so good? There's fewer people today, so it just everyone feels a little more distant. All right, so let's look a little bit more at this verse. So the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. What's, this, what's my next slide? Just, okay, we'll go back to that. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. One commentator, Walkie, talks about that the... Of course, the first person is persuasive. He's impressive. It sounds so good. Everybody's like, this is impressive. But in order to be able to come at the truth, the person that comes, the second person, has to be able to probe, has to examine and test. It implies that, we see the word examines? Examines? That's the one that kind of I really want to focus on. The second person that comes and he questions, he interrogates, he picks apart. And it's, it's, in order for this person to do that, he has to be just as competent and skilled as the first person to be able to arrive at the truth. If the person doesn't know what he's talking about, the person who's speaking the lie will win. But because sometimes the truth is difficult to, to find, sometimes when there's a situation that's confusing, it requires wisdom to be able to probe and question and interrogate the first person to speak. You have to, you have to, in order to arrive at the truth, you have to hear both sides. But the, the second person to speak has to do a direct cross-examination before rendering a decision. I think it's interesting that it says Proverbs 20, in Proverbs 25 too, it says, it is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. And I, thought, I always thought that was beautiful because God does like leave certain mysteries. Have you ever asked God for the answer to something and he just doesn't give it? It's just, 
Sometimes you just have to figure it out on your own. <laughs> he wants you to exercise those wisdom muscles because you're called to rule, you're called to reign. And even in your lives, you now exercise authority over the things in your life. But God will put more and more things, will entrust more and more things. The, the scene, if you can imagine, is like at the town, at the gate of the town, the elders usually would sit there and then when there would be difficult cases, people would bring it to them and then they would have to hear both sides. But, but if they were wise elders, they would listen to both sides to arrive at the truth and make a, a good judgment. It's necessary to hear both sides. Because often, like we said, the first person to present the case is very persuasive. In Acts chapter 24, Paul is being tried. And it says in verse 1, Acts 24 verse 1, it says, after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. So remember that name, Tertullus. I don't know how to pronounce it, but let's just go with that one. And they laid before the governor their case against Paul. So these are the people accusing Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, since through you, so here's Tertullus, he's making his case. They obviously picked him because he was good, right? Since through you, he's talking to Felix, the, the ruler, through you we enjoy much peace. And since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation. In every way and everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. He's flattering the ruler, right? But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man, Paul, we have found this man a plague, one who steers up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized them. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. So you're like, oh, Paul's in trouble. This guy sounds very persuasive. He's making the case against Paul. The, Jew, the Jews, it says in verse 9, also joined in the charge, affirming all these things were so. So not only did this persuasive lawyer make the case against Paul, but then everybody there was like, yup, that's exactly how it went down. In verse 10, and when the governor had nodded for him to speak, Paul replied. And then Paul, but Paul is now, he's no bum either, right? He, he knows, we've read his letters, we know that the man knows how to argue, right? Paul says, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. He's the second to state his case. And then he goes on. I, I, we don't have time to read the whole thing, but I encourage you to read the whole thing. And then you see Paul make his, his defense, and he makes a real good defense. He's like, man, Paul was good. And not only that, but Paul used the opportunity to preach the gospel to Felix, the governor. You know? So I'm like, Paul always looked for an opportunity to preach the gospel. It didn't matter how powerful, how poor they were, Paul always did. But that's in Acts 24 if you want to read it. But, but here we see the, that interplay uh, happening. There's the case of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. We are familiar with the story, right? Joseph is a servant in, uh, in Pharaoh's uh, home. And he went in there one day and none of the household servants was inside. So Potiphar's wife, she's been trying to sleep with Joseph for a while now because he's good looking. And so she's been trying to sleep with him, but Joseph is like, I can't do that. You know, you're the Pharaoh's wife. I mean, no, no, not the Pharaoh's, uh, Potiphar, uh, Potiphar's wife. So she grabs, so this time there was no one around. So she's like, this is my chance. So she pounces on him. She grabs him by the cloak and, and says, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. So he runs out. He's got like no clothes. I think he's got no clothes on, right? Um, or at least he doesn't have the cloak. He doesn't have the cloak. And when she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. And then when the husband um, comes home, he tells, she tells the same story. And of course, he gets angry. And Joseph, through a false accusation, ends up in prison. The first to make the case often seems right but we have to know be able we have to have the wisdom the pre, the patience and the impartiality to be able to hear both sides of these situations so far so good am i making sense so far we'll keep going why do we need to be impartial we looked at 
we looked at it briefly. We looked at what it means. We saw some cases of it uh, playing out. It's important that we don't make hasty judgments when we're evaluating different claims. When it comes to issues of doctrine, for example, you might hear somebody from a different religion make a certain case and say this, and that sounds persuasive. But if you don't know your stuff, you might be persuaded. Or some, and this is a political, it's an election year, right? We have to evaluate competing claims. The first to speak sometimes like, man, they're making sense. And in our time, and in our time, sometimes if, it, if the person making the first case is impressive, they're like, oh, that's an impressive looking person. They know how to speak well. They may be rich. They may be influential. They may be celebrities. So it may be easy to be persuaded by them. Or also, people may be using emotions to manipulate. That's a common thing people do, like Potiphar's wife. I mean, talk about if, if, you, if someone uses tears or outrage, sometimes people use that to convince you of their side. And so, and it's a very common tactic in our day to claim being a victim in order to persuade people to your side. So, in the face of that kind of questioning or, I mean, presentation, you have to be able to develop this virtue of impartiality. And the main reason why we should be impartial is because God is impartial. It says in many places in the Bible that God is impartial, that God shows no partiality. In other words, God cannot be emotionally manipulated. He can't, you can't intimidate God. You're like, hey, God, you're going to let me have my way or what? You know what I mean? You can't intimidate God. You can't manipulate him. You can't, he can't be tricked. God can't be gaslit. Right? It doesn't matter how many tears you cry. Like, oh, they get him to convince him to your side. He's impartial. He's perfectly, he's truth in all its perfection. He's unchanging. So we want to be like God, right? And God is impartial. Man, so many verses. Deuteronomy 10, 17 to 18 says, For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. So God is not swayed by the rich and powerful. He will do justice each time. It doesn't matter if the rich have the, all the best lawyers. God will always look out for the fatherless and the widow. Second Chronicles 19.7 Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do, for there is no injustice with the Lord our God, or partiality, or taking bribes. God cannot be bribed, cannot be tricked, cannot be manipulated. Uh, there's so many others, I can't, I, can't, I can't do all of them. Let me skip. We already talked about Acts 10, where Peter sees the Holy Spirit come down on Cornelius and his household and is shocked because they're Gentiles. And so far, up to this point, the, the Christian faith has only been Jewish people. And now the Holy Spirit comes down upon the Gentiles and they, when they hear the gospel. And now he says, P Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. There is no Jew or Greek anymore in Christ. But in every nation, who, those who fear him does what is right is acceptable to him. And, and, and um, Josh has talked about this already in Romans. He's already covered Romans 2, right? It says in Romans 2, 9 through 11, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and, and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. Verse 11, for God shows no partiality. It's an important quality of God. In, in, in the context of what's happening in that chapter of Romans, as, as Josh has already explained, it's that God, Paul is describing that God, that all are guilty before God, whether Jew, who has the law, or non-Jew, Gentiles, who don't have the law. All are sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, for there is no partiality with God. And salvation equally is to all, for God shows no partiality. Partiality. Salvation is available to all people, rich and poor, doesn't matter what ethnicity, doesn't matter what gender, right? In Christ there is no Jew nor Greek, male or female, a slave or free, for you are all one in Christ Jesus and heirs together with Abraham, right? 
Paul, when he's talking about those who he met, when he met first the, the first leaders of the church, and they said, and from those who seem to be influential, and then he puts in parentheses, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. It doesn't matter if they were influential or not. Ephesians 6, 9, masters, he tells, you know, masters to treat their, their servants well. Masters do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. That's Ephesians 6, 9. And Colossians 3, 25, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done and there is no partiality. God is impartial. There is no partiality with God. So because, because God is impartial, we too need to be impartial. We need to be interested in what is true, what is right, not just in justifying ourselves. Right? Man, there's so many verses. But I'll just read a few. We're commanded to not show partiality, to not be swayed from one side or the other. Exodus, Exodus 23, 2-3, You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit, siding with the many so as to pervert justice. Nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. So it's interesting. Don't side with the rich, he's saying. Don't side with the mob, but also don't side with the poor. Because the poor might be the one that's wrong in, in, in a certain case. Leviticus 19.15 You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You're supposed to be even-handed when you're making, uh, when you're evaluating different claims. And there's many other verses: Deuteronomy 1:16, Deuteronomy 16, Job 13:10, Proverbs 18:5. It is not good to be partial to the wicked. Proverbs 24:23. Partiality and judging is not good. Whoever says to the wicked, "You are right," he will be cursed by peoples. Proverbs 28:21. To show partiality is not good. In his other verses, Malachi, I could go on. But I'm just trying to make a point that this is a quality that God possesses and that we are called to possess. 1 Timothy 5, 20-22. As for those who persist in sin, Paul is instructing Timothy, if there's people in the congregation that are continuing in sin, in unrepentant sin, he says, rebuke them in the presence of all. A public rebuke. So that the rest may stand in fear in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels. I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Doing nothing from partiality. Telling Timothy when it comes time to decide cases in church, tough cases, you can't be partial. So how do we apply this quality in, in our life? For one, we could apply it when we examine different claims, for example. And one obvious example, again, is the election, right? Everybody has competing claims. So one person throws out one ad, and another one puts out a competing ad. One person says, this is what we should do. Another person says, this is what we should do. And in a time when people use mostly emotional manipulation to make their case, we have to be able to take a step back and be objective and be clear and be fair. To, because we are to be concerned with what is true. But it also applies to things of doctrine, especially things of doctrine. Galatians 1, 6-9. Paul says to the Galatians, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But Paul says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Paul is demonstrating that we're supposed to, if anything is in opposition to the gospel, we're supposed to analyze that statement carefully to be able to see what's to dissect it, to tear apart, to interrogate it, to be able to arrive at the truth. And you have to be up to the task. How are you be able to do that if you don't know your word, right? We have to know our word so that you won't be easily swayed by false gospels or false doctrine. Amen? You agree with me on that one? Yes? I hope so. 
We're supposed to be people of the word, to know our, our Bible back and forth, to be able to know that's not true. And, he, and you can tell them, hey, I don't know exactly why is that true. I'll get back to you, but I know that's not true. But, but also, but you should be ready sometimes for some, some basics, right? We talked about in, in the afternoon Bible study about the deity of Jesus, which is something that the Jehovah's Witnesses often attack. And they might show up at your door, and you have to be ready to say, no, Jesus is God, and it's clear from here in the Scripture. We have to argue for and defend the biblical truth in a way that's going to stand up to the scrutiny of others. Be competent. Be able. Be study. Paul tells Timothy, right? Study to show yourself approved. A workman who is not ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth, right? I just paraphrased it, but you guys know that verse, right? We have to be expert when it comes to the word. So that's the first application. Using this principle. What's the principle? The one who states his case fears seems right until the other comes and examines him. Use this principle to evaluate competing claims, whether about politics or other controversies, about doctrine, etc. We have to be people of the truth. But the second application, and uh, it could be a sermon all on its own, and, I, and the amount of notes I wrote on this next section could be another sermon, but I'll try to go real quickly. But let's, let's turn to Matthew 18, 15 through 18. Because now we're going to apply this principle that the one who states his case seems right at first and the second one though must come and examine him to arrive at the truth. We're going to apply it to the situation of conflicts inside the church. And that's what this passage is about. Matthew 15, Matthew 18, sorry, Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 18. And you can just stay there for a while. Because the main verse is up there anyway, so you can just linger there for a little bit. Everybody there? Amen. Amen. Let's go. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. So Jesus is giving us instruction on correction and discipline in the church. And we see that this quality of impartiality is crucial to be able to judge these kind of situations. So let's say somebody sins against you in the church. So they're a brother in Christ. They're a sister in Christ. And they have actually sinned against you. What are, what's supposed to happen? It says that you are supposed to go and tell them. You, the person offended, the person injured, is the one that initiates the process. Which can be kind of scary sometimes, especially, you know, some people like confrontation, so it's not scary for them. Others don't. So they're like, I don't know, maybe it's all right, I'll just let it pass. You know? No, you have to go and initiate, say, you committed this against me. But in this case, you're the one that states their case first. So you better make sure that you know what you're talking about, that they actually did sin against you. That it wasn't just, oh, they looked at me funny, or I don't like their face, Right? It has to be an actual sin committed. Did they actually steal something from you? Did they say actual words to slander you to somebody? Was there any kind of deceit in any way? Was there any sexual impropriety? If there is actual sin involved, Jesus is instructing us here to confront it. All right, so you have to interrogate yourself. Like, did, did I actually, is it really happening? Am I just imagining it, you know? Interrogate yourself, examine yourself, and if there is indeed sin, then go ahead and confront. And it says, if he listens to you, hallelujah, you have gained your brother. The person says, oh man, you're right, I messed up, I'm sorry, and, and then the, the relationship is restored. But if the person does not, if you tell them, and it's an actual sin, you 
said these things to this person and I have the proof and they don't want to confess or if, they actually, if there was sexual impropriety or something was stolen, there's real money owed, there's an actual sin. And the person's like, you know, like whatever, I, you know, they don't repent. They don't acknowledge what they did. So verse 16 says what to do next. Verse 16, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So that's the next step. So the person does not listen. He is not convinced. He does not show any remorse or repentance. So you, right, you're a, you're a, you're a mature, biblically trained, spirit-filled person. Amen? Everyone here? Most of you here? Hopefully. But you still weren't able to get through to your brother. And because sometimes that happens. We're still sinners, even the most mature among us. But so here God is providing another step to be able to restore fellowship in the church. He says, take two or three witnesses with you. And here God has given us another principle of justice. We already learned one principle of justice, right? Impartiality. Being able to be fair, hearing both sides. But here God gives us another principle of justice. Deuteronomy 19.15 says, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. 2 Corinthians 13.1, this is the third time I'm coming to you. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And 1 Timothy 5.19, when it comes to a charge against a pastor or an elder, do not omit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. We see that God is concerned with truth. And an accusation on its own is not enough to convict someone, whether it be in a court of law or a church court, so to speak. You need two or three witnesses to establish the truth of a claim. And those people must have impartiality, right? You don't want to take someone just because they're your friend. And they're going to side with you. You want to bring someone that's impartial, able to hear both sides and judge fairly, including telling you, hey, brother, I think you're the one in the wrong, actually. Which might happen. But since you're a mature, spiritual, spirit-filled, biblically literate, you'll accept it, right? Because something doesn't happen. They have to be objective, spiritual, mature, wise. Galatians 6.1 gives more instruction on this. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So the person that's being called to restore, to intervene, has to be gentle. Has to know that the purpose of this interaction is to restore the people. And they have to be humble enough to know that they too are sinners and could have easily fallen into the same sin. So we have to be that kind of people and so does the people that come to, to, to listen to the argument. But it, so if the, if the accusation is true, the person is convicted, he confesses, he repents, he pays the consequences if there's restitution to be made and there's a... There's a uh, the relationship could be restored. But one thing that I want to impress upon everyone is that, let me see. I'll, I'll say it in a little bit. Okay, let's finish with the last phase of the, of the, of the, of the process here. Verse 17. So let's say that two people come. They're reasonable people. They're objective people. They're impartial. They're wise. But if the person refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the, even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, kick him out of the church, it says. That's what it says. But in order for this process to work, it needs mature people who are impartial, who are spiritual, who are wise, who know the law of God. And I think we should ask ourselves if we are that kind of people. Because right, in, in, a, in a Baptist church, we have congregational government, right? And congregational government depends 
Uh, the, we have the, the officers of the church, this is the, pa- the pastors, sometimes called elders, right? The pastors, the deacons. They have a certain role. But in the congregation, the church, so does the congregation. And if the congregation is not wise, mature, impartial, fair, if they don't know what true justice is, not according to the world, but according to the law of God, then how will they be able to rule? How will they, what kind of church will that be? What kind of church? Can you imagine a church of immature people? What would that kind of church like that be? I can't, I can't imagine a church like that, but, but there's, I'm sure there's churches like that, you know? I'm sure there's churches like that. Um, but we don't want to be that kind of church. So we have to develop this. Impartiality is just one of the many qualities, but for some reason, this verse just jumped at me and I decided to, to preach on it. But we need to have that kind of wisdom. Proverbs says to seek out wisdom, cry out for it. Because here we're given a process for how to handle church government and church discipline. But it does require wise people and spiritual people and impartial people to be able to get these things right. There's, I don't have, I'm running out of time here. So, but 18 and 20, look at verses 18 through 20. They're really shocking because it says that whatever we bind on earth as a congregation, because think of the context here. What is being talked about here? A brother who has sinned, who has refused to repent, and has now been brought before the congregation, and now refuses to repent even before the congregation. So this is a person in hardened, unrepentant, continual sin. And God, Jesus says that if you bind something on earth, if the church makes a decision to kick this person out, Jesus says that decision is valid even in heaven. Like up there, it's like, all right, cool. They decided that that's valid. It's binding. Because the church has real authority on the earth that Christ gave to it. And it says if you lose something in, on the earth, it will be loosed in heaven. Again, he says it in another way. If two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. The authority that God gave the church on the earth is as real as the civil authority. It's just dealing with different jurisdictions. And then verse 20, we all know this verse really well, right? For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Usually we think it like, oh, if two of us are hanging out, having coffee, God is Jesus. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about when court is in session during a difficult conflict at church, I, Jesus, am there presiding over the process. That's his promise to us. I had a... I'm going to skip some stuff here. Finally, I want to leave this final application. And this applies to anyone who's not a believer in Christ. Or someone who maybe is a little shaky in their faith. God says, and I love this verse, come now, let us reason together. Come now, let us reason together. We're talking about an argument, right? In court, like kind of like court or people debating or people not in agreement. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. So God wants to reason with you, right? The full verse says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. He's trying to reason with you and and says, look, the world is the first to state their case regarding sin, regarding heaven and hell. And what is... And what does the world say about sin? It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. But God is the second one, and he makes his case and says that we need to think carefully about the deadly consequences of sin. And John Owen, he said this. If you never read John Owen, you should. He says, this therefore is what is absolutely necessary to come to Christ. To be quite convinced that you are a sinner as to your state and behavior. That you are not righteous in yourself and you have no hope of being righteous in yourself. In other words, if you don't have conviction for sin, then you won't come to Christ. Because you won't be convinced you need Him. Even if those of you that may have grown up in church, you need to pause and reconsider if at any point 
in your Christian life or in your, in your life here that maybe you acknowledge, yeah, I'm not perfect. Everyone knows that. But not, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about coming to a deep sense in your inner self that you are hopelessly lost. And you're wicked in every way, in your thoughts, intentions, in your words, in your behavior. Test yourself, like it says in 2 Corinthians 13. If you don't really believe in the seriousness of sin or the reality of hell, if you don't think you're actually sick, you're not going to come to the doctor because you're not, in your mind you're not sick. So the world may say, they may be the first to state their case and say, sin's not that bad. That's a big deal or I'll change later. But God here today is telling you through his word, through his spirit. He's here to examine that claim that the sin is not that bad. He's here to interrogate that claim, to dismantle it. And he's letting you know that yes, your sins are that bad. And in fact, your sins are way worse than you even imagine. And if you've never arrived at that conviction of your own evil, your own sin, if you've never had that, it's because you've never considered the absolute perfect holiness of God and his perfect justice. And that's why you're, willing, you're actually okay with your sin. Because if you were to actually contemplate for a second how holy God is, you wouldn't. You would have fear instead. John Piper talks about when Peter, when Peter, you know, when Jesus tells Peter to cast the net on the one side and he comes in and has all this fish, and what does Peter do? He, he fell down at Jesus' feet and says, depart from me for I am a sinful man. In other words, seeing Jesus caused that reaction in, in Peter. Because when we see Jesus as he really is, then we see our own wickedness as it really is. But when we don't, then our sin doesn't look that bad. And then we just like the world, it's not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal. But Piper goes on to say, to be blind or oblivious to the wrath of God against sin is incredibly dangerous, he says. It's like not being able to smell the gas leak gathering around the pilot light of your water heater, ready to blow your basement to smithereens and burn your house to the ground. It is so dangerous not to be aware of the anger of God against sin. And the reason it is so dangerous is that if you are blind to this reality of God's wrath and the reality of hell, then you won't take steps to find a remedy for the sin and an escape for God's anger. So he goes on to say that what happened to Peter then is a wonderful thing, it's a beautiful thing to actually come face to face with God and then, and then in the light of God's holiness see the ugliness of your own sin. It's actually a good thing because that, one, that there is the beginning of your repentance, the beginning of a true conversion. So you should seek to see God in his perfect holiness and let him, with his light, examine the sin that still remains in your life. And then you have hope of being healed. But as long as you deny it, you won't. 